first, uh, well, this is the typical interview question, but I am kind of curious. Why James? Uh, of all the books you could write, I see Hebrews. Hebrews is beautiful. We both love the Epistle of Hebrews. Why James? Yeah. Um, Gary, I guess the answer is just it. as I was reading and thinking about James, it really jumped out at me, the connections that are there where we can see James as a starting point to unpack various different Catholic beliefs. Like, of course, justification, that's a big one in James, but also James, he's where we're introduced to the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Uh, We talk about intercessory prayer in James, the value of a a saintly person in praying. But um, James also, just his very epistle, it becomes a great a great reason to talk about the canon of scripture because James is not one of those books that you see in the earliest list of what makes up the New Testament. And of course, Martin Luther at the time of the Reformation, he had problems with James, uh, wanted to relegate it to a second class status in the canon. Uh, Also, when we talk about James, this work is usually attributed to James quote, the brother of the Lord, the brother of Jesus. And so what does that mean? And that gives us an opportunity to talk about the Blessed Mother and her perpetual virginity. Also, I noticed where James, he talked a lot about our obligations towards those who are poor. And um, the church's social teaching, you know, we've got this huge body of social teaching, and that was an area that I personally had not delved much into. And so studying James became um, an impetus for to look into that more deeply. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, it is unusual, isn't it? It's uh, like you said, uh, it uh, didn't make it on some uh, canonical, early canonical list. Um, mm-hmm. It certainly was contested by Martin Luther famously, you know, where he says he, he'd want to throw Jimmy into the fire. Uh, because of its teachings on justification. So it actually it touched on some very important theological topics like justification and uh, and also the, even the sacrament of uh, anointing of the sick. Um, yeah. And yeah. And also there's mysteries about it, like its authorship. Uh, how about dating? Do you any idea when uh, Epistle of James was written? This is one of those epistles that... What it says, as well as what it doesn't say, <laughs> um, scholars will take as a hint to when it was written. Now, we the first time that we hear it quoted in the early church is in uh, Clement's epistle to the Corinthians. And so by 95 AD, we see this epistle being used by the Bishop of Rome. And the epistle itself, it is addressed by James to... Um, to Jewish Christians in the diaspora. So um, he's writing to Jews, and we see in chapter two, he talks about them meeting in synagogues. So it would seem like this is very early. Um, Now, James, he doesn't seem to have any knowledge of Gentiles coming to faith. So Paul, he really started his mission to the Gentiles around 48, 49 AD. And James, uh, we know that he was martyred in 62 AD. So, you know, if, if he doesn't have any knowledge of Gentiles coming into the faith, he's writing purely to Jewish Christians. We're probably talking like late 40s or very early 50s. So right. some people say that James may be the earliest New Testament document. That's a possibility. Um it's, it's fascinating to me because there are a couple places in James where it's obvious that he is quoting Jesus. He doesn't identify it as a quotation of Christ, but when we m- look at these words and then what Jesus says in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, it's so obvious that James is quoting the Lord. And there are other sections in the epistle where it matches up quite well with Christ's words in the gospel. Now, if James is being written late 40s, early 50s, uh, 
that's usually earlier than what we would say any of the Gospels were written. So James would then be the earliest written uh, appearance that we have of some words of Christ. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. You know, it's funny because we're so used to the canonical order of books in the New Testament, and it it seems like it's 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 laid out chronologically, right? Mm -hmm. So since James is at the end, you normally don't think of it as potentially being a really early document. You always think of it as something relatively late, just because of the canonical order. But like you said, it's quite possible it could be maybe one of the earliest to be written. Yeah, I think that um, Jimmy Aiken in the book he did on scripture a couple years ago, I think he lists James as the earliest in his opinion. Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, so uh, so very early testimony, um, perhaps you know, right alongside or maybe even before the writings of Paul, even. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the author. Now, you already okay. kind of touched on that. Uh, he's the brother of the Lord. So what right. does that mean? Yeah. Um, as I'm sure you've talked about with your listeners before, Gary, that when the New Testament identifies James as the brother of the Lord, it's using Greek terminology, but it's communicating Semitic ideas. And so that word brother in, in Greek, we take it to mean you know, someone who is a, a child of the same mother and father. But in Hebrew thought, brother is any type of relation. I mean, you can even use it for countrymen. Um, we use it in a, in a figurative sense that way ourselves today. But in the New Testament, when it talks about in Nazareth, um, when Jesus comes back there to preach and the people say, you know, isn't this the carpenter's son, um, the son of Mary? Don't we know his brothers, James and Jude and Simon and uh, and Josie? Um, well, that term brother there, we understand that to mean either cousins or first cousins or some kind of other relation to the Lord Jesus. James, he's known throughout the early church as either James of Jerusalem or James, the brother of the Lord. Jerusalem was where he exercised his ministry. It looks like he was ordained as an overseer of the church, what we today would call a bishop, and he oversaw its day-to-day -day activity as the apostles went about the work of evangelism and gradually spread out from Jerusalem. One um, In the early church, there seemed to be two opinions as to how James was related to Jesus. And um, one that we see in the Proto-Evangelion Proto of James, written probably between 100 and 130 AD, is that James was a son of Joseph from a prior marriage, that Joseph was widowed and then married the Blessed Mother. Uh, the other opinion that we see from Papias of Heropolis was that James was one of our Lord's first cousins. And uh, St. Jerome, he followed Papias's line of thought. Of course, what's common to both of those is the historical memory that everyone knew this wasn't Jesus' blood brother, not a child of Mary and Joseph, that he is related to Jesus in some other way, and they try to explain it. So I think the best explanation is when we look at the accounts of the crucifixion, and it talks about Mary being at the foot of the cross with another Mary that it calls her sister in John's gospel. Well, it'd be strange for two sisters of the same family to be named Mary. So when it says the blessed mother's sister, we're probably talking about either a cousin or possibly a sister-in-law through Joseph. In the other gospels, when it identifies this Mary, it refers to her as the mother of James or the mother of Joseph. So those are two of the brothers that we hear of named earlier in the Gospels as being brothers of Jesus. In this case, we can see that they would be first cousins. So um, that's that to me is the most satisfying historical explanation for who the author of this epistle is and what his relationship is to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I, I 
tend to go in that direction as well. Although uh, I don't think you could rule out the first option, though, but I, I kind of gravitate in that way, too. Now, you mentioned the audience is a Hebrew audience. Um, because, yes. Like you said, he did, doesn't seem to be aware of uh, lots of Gentiles coming into the church at this point. No, completely silent on that point. I mean, he, he is strictly addressing a Jewish audience. Okay. Now, of course, in Paul's letters, Paul's writing to mixed communities. And um, so Paul, when he talks about things like works of the law, Paul is going to have a very di different emphasis when he talks about the law than what James will in his epistle. And that's one of those points where, of course, of course, Martin Luther could seize upon what Paul said about not being justified through works of the law and try to set that up in opposition, opposition to James, who does talk about justification through both faith and works. Yeah, 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 that's famous. In fact, uh, Luther, I believe, I mean, he, he saw that as a flat out contradiction. And mainly because of that, he downgraded James, like you mentioned earlier, to a, a yeah. secondary, you know, deuterocanonical status or, or maybe like a New Testament apocryphal Work. Although I, I don't know if he actually ever went that far, but nevertheless, he did segregate it from the rest of the, the books of the New Testament. Well, Shane, I, I hear the music coming up, so we'll just hit pause right there. You brought up a really important uh, apologetic point on law and faith and good works. So we'll talk about that on the other side of the break. We're chatting with Shane Kapler. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. 